Hey, this video contains spoilers for the whole DMC series, you have been warned. DMC has incredibly fleshed out characters, because a lot of their character is built or supported through gameplay. Move sets, animations, taunts. For example, this taunt where Lady Spanks herself could be seen as just that. Or you might recognize it as a reference to Jester, her father's insane alter ego. When we last left her, she had just killed him, after he had sacrificed her mother and stabbed her in the leg, and that was almost a decade ago, so how's she doing now? Well, we see her emulating Jester, possibly ironically, and it can lead to some interesting interpretation. See, I see this as more than a spank. It could be her dealing with her trauma through some kind of twisted humor. She's doing this thing her father at his worst used to do mockingly, as if to frame her father as ridiculous. She's risen above the pain and can now engage in levity towards the subject, right? Well, I don't know. She's still doing it. Arguably, the topic is still quite heavy in her mind. She hasn't moved on. I mean, she's still spanking. It's like how your friend wants to show that they've come to terms with their divorce by joking about it constantly. This one animation offers a lot of insight into Lady's character in DMC4, and the beauty of it is, is that this is something you can only see in gameplay. One example of the myriad mechanics working towards depicting a character. But this video isn't about animations, I just wanted to talk about Lady's ass. No, in this video, I'll be looking at another aspect of the mechanics resources, and going over how they inform, flesh out, or detract from the characters in question. I'll only be looking at Dante, Virgil, and Nero for this video. I'm sure there are a few things I could say about V, but I doubt they'd be too substantial, and the same goes for Lady and Trish. Like, why don't, why don't you tell me about Trish? What does this thing tell us about her character? Is it that she likes to throw stuff? How does that make you feel? Anyway, I'll be going through each of the games, all four of them, every single one, looking at each of the characters' resources and discussing how they work to convey and build character. So let's start at the beginning with... In DMC1, there is only one resource, besides health, and it does the baseline job of establishing who and what Dante, and by extension Devil May Cry, is. The resource is, of course, Devil Trigger. It's a resource that, when expended, transforms Dante into his demon form, in which he moves faster, deals more damage, takes less damage, regains health, and gains access to special moves. The first thing this tells us is that Dante is part demon. Cool. Simple establishing stuff, but this is the first game. This used to be a big deal, now everyone has a keyblade. Anyway, you gain DT by attacking enemies, raising the style meter by varying your attacks, and of course, by taunting. Essentially, you get DT by playing well. And voila, this tells us all we need to know. He's a good fighter, he fights stylishly, and he's cheeky, he'll taunt his enemies mid-combat. DT rewards you both for playing well and in a way that supports who Dante is as a character. And to me, it paints a picture of someone who is in full control of any combat scenario. He's comfortable enough to taunt a giant volcanic spider in the middle of a fight. And he likes varying up his attacks, possibly for the fun of it, possibly for the sake of looking stylish, or just to assert dominance. To me, it's for the fun of it, though, and I think this interpretation will be the most supported in future. I should also touch on DT's relation to the style meter. Style is the ultimate goal in DMC, and playing stylishly will net you more DT, which you can use to be even more stylish. See, it's, it's a feedback loop. Performing well gives you the tools to perform well -er. It's neat. And that's it for DMC1. It works to establish who Dante is at a base level, but as we'll see, it won't remain this way. As early as DMC2, we're given other characters who have access to a DT that works similarly, if not exactly the same way as it does for Dante. And this will continue for every new character in the series. Except Lady, who's kind of a special case. She basically has Devil Trigger, but it's not Devil Trigger. Yeah. Post DMC1, Devil Trigger is no longer Dante's defining mechanic. Rather, it is a staple of Devil May Cry. It's a shame that Dante had to share his resource, but it makes sense. DT rewards players for playing well, so of course it's extended to every character, to reward good play. It also makes sense for the characters given what they are. Every character is part demon, every character is a proficient fighter, and every character is wont to taunt their enemies. From here on, the specific taunts work to build character, as we saw with Lady Spanking. But back in DMC1, the fact that Dante taunted at all was a character-defining feature. 
Before I move on, I also want to touch on the fact that DT can also be filled by taking damage. It's not a sustainable farming method, it's a consolation prize, so I wouldn't say that the game incentivizes you to take damage. Nonetheless, the fact that you gain DT from damage is significant. Getting hurt gives the player a means to regain the upper hand, more incentive to play better. I'd say it portrays the characters as getting amped up by the fight. Maybe they get angry, they start taking the fight more seriously. Again, simple stuff, but this is just the beginning. Let's skip over to DMC4 and talk about Nero, the up-and-coming devil hunter who seems to have a bit of an inferiority complex, at least when it comes to Dante. <laughs> As early as his first mission, he's got something to prove to him. And I'm just going to do some signposting. This dynamic with Dante is going to be central to my interpretation. I think we can derive more meaning by contrasting Nero's mechanics to Dante's, but we'll get to that. So, as we established, Nero also has DT, but he has his own defining resources, and the first is Exceed. Nero can rev his sword up like a motorcycle and use the... engine? to unleash powerful attacks. There are three notches of Exceed to fill, and you can spend them individually to enhance individual strikes in a combo, or you can spend them all at once on a directional attack. There are two ways to build Exceed. Either you take the time to rev up your sword, or you can time a rev to your attacks and build it up mid-combo. Obviously, the latter is more efficient, but requires more skill to pull off. The ability Max Act fills up all three gauges if you time your rev perfectly to further incentivize you to use the latter. The second of Nero's resources is his charge shot. Basically, if you hold down the gun button, it will charge Nero's gun up until you can unleash progressively more powerful shots. So how do these resources affect how you play? Well, they do so in two ways, I think. Firstly, since you can gain these resources for no cost outside of combat, I'd say you're incentivized to do so. Why not enter every combat encounter with three notches of exceed and a fully charged gun? Doing otherwise puts you at an objective disadvantage. So, I'd say these resources push you to prepare for combat ahead of time. Secondly, you're incentivized to give more consideration to every attack you pull off. With your sword, you need to time an additional button press for every single attack. With your gun, you need to charge every shot ahead of time. Blue Rose is quite pathetic without being charged, so you want to charge it at least to some degree to make any shot effective. Essentially, Nero requires more attention on his gun and sword than Dante to be efficient in combat. These basic ass mechanics demand more consideration, whereas Dante had the shit down in his first appearance. So what does this tell us about Nero? Well, I think it all works into this idea of Nero having something to prove. His mechanics make it feel like he's trying so much harder than Dante to be efficient, to come off as cool. Timing exceed, charging your gun, I think it makes Nero feel very self-conscious, and this extends to your ability to prep for combat. This is something Dante wouldn't do. Despite him not being able to in 1 through 4, I don't get the impression that Dante preps himself. He knows he doesn't have to. With Nero, however, you're mechanically incentivized to do so. I think it telegraphs Nero's lack of confidence or skill, at least in comparison to Dante. He takes extra consideration, mentally and physically prepping before battle, to come off as cool and proficient as he can when the time comes. Or rather, he should take extra consideration. If you're confident enough in timing Max Act, you may not prep, and you may enter combat with an unrevved sword, knowing you'll earn plenty of exceed throughout the fight. If you're skilled, this is a fair assumption to make, but objectively, it isn't. Objectively, the odds that someone will ever land a max act are tiny. If it's frame perfect, which I'm pretty sure it is, and an attack takes one second, that's a 1 in 60 chance every attack. An experienced player can get the timing down pretty consistently, but the odds on paper are still incredibly low. As such, forgoing your opportunity to rev before combat gives the impression that Nero is willing to bet his success on realistically terrible odds. I think this makes Nero feel cockier than he has any right to be. He's brash, he'll jump in the lake to save the puppy despite not being able to swim. I wouldn't call this confidence, it's more like arrogance, stubbornness, or to link it back to the idea of Nero having something to prove, it's like he's wildly overcompensating. He presents as if he's got any situation in the bag, and he very well may, but objectively, he's betting on bad odds. He can't guarantee that he can back up what he's selling. 
Here's a concise way to explain the difference between Nero and Dante. When Nero and Dante come across a boss, they both taunt them. Dante does this because he's not scared, he knows he's in full control of the situation. Nero does this because he wants to give the impression that he's in control of the situation. That, that's how I see it. He's a tryhard, whereas Dante is just hard. So fucking hard. But let's go back to exceed, because I only discussed how to earn the resource. The other part of the equation is spending it. An interesting aspect about exceed is the fact that you can't save it. It must be spent. If you have a notch of exceed, no questions asked, your next attack will be augmented, and that notch will be spent. A directional attack will automatically spend all of your exceed. There's no stopping it. As such, exceed commits you to certain actions. It actually locks you out of more moves than it gives you access to. It's just that the moves you're locked to are usually better. As such, you're somewhat at the mercy of the resource, especially when you consider how precise the timing on X and max act is. It's nigh impossible to ensure that you max act every attack. It's unreliable by design. Part of playing Nero is learning to roll with the punches and make split-second decisions based on what your exceed level ends up being, or, since gameplay can be pretty fast-paced, where your attacks leave you. You may not have expected to hit a max act and go barreling across the arena, but you're here now, what do you do? You may have expected to land an exceed, but you didn't. You're here now, what do you do? You're at the mercy of the mechanic to some extent. It dictates your options. As such, I think Exceed's animations are incredibly appropriate. Nero's X attacks give the impression that he can barely control the power of his sword, Zenjin. Look at how X Streak has him basically dragged along by the force of his sword, and the same is true for X High Roller. Like Nero's animations, it's almost as if the player is dealing with powers slightly beyond their control. The sword is leading the player as much as the player is leading the sword. I think this all feeds into my interpretation of Nero as a tryhard, or someone who's overcompensating. He's putting in 110%. He tries to output the strongest attacks possible despite barely being able to control them. He foregoes control for power. This is also reflected in the mechanical nature of his exceeded attacks. When you use max streak, max shuffle, or max high roller, you lose control for a moment. The animations simply take longer and you just let them play out. You can take a breath and let Nero do his thing for a few seconds. Again, you forego control for power, and that's not always a good deal. Max High Roller, for example, can leave you exposed while you're locked in the animation, whereas a normal High Roller takes less time to execute, giving you an extra crucial second of control. The same is true for X Shuffle, X Streak may cause you to overshoot your target, and so on. But there's probably something meaningful to be said about the fact that you can regain control in the middle of any of these attacks by cancelling them with Devil Trigger. The one thing that allows Nero to rein his weapon in is his demonic power, the power he shares with Dante, and the power he's self-conscious of and has had trouble accepting. It's like, aw, the power was in you all along. You never needed to sacrifice control. See, the thing about power is not about loss. Strength is a choice. Then again, if you do an X attack whilst in DT, there's no stopping it. So just enjoy the ride. Charge Shot also puts you at its mercy in its own way. This resource does not exist unless you're holding down a button. Any level of charge is preferable to base blue rose, so you are mechanically demanded to hold down this button. An entire finger, or in my case my thumb, is claimed by this one resource. On the other end of the extreme, once blue rose is fully charged, the optimal thing to do is fire it immediately, so you can start charging it up again. Any time you spend sitting on a fully charged gun is wasted potential. This light on Nero's hand is demanding you now release the button, the gun telling you when it should be fired. Of course, it was your decision to charge the gun, this is just the bing of the oven timer, but when you're tending to the food on the stove, that bing can seem like a bit of an imposition, no? A charge shot 3 usually comes in clutch, for sure, but there are times where you fire one just because you have it, and it's mechanically unwise to sit on it. You may have wanted to do something else, or you may not have known what you were going to do, but now you know you're going to shoot your gun. I didn't talk about the physical implications of Exceed, that Nero is literally revving every time he swings, because I don't understand how that system works well enough to draw anything from it. Like, 
I, I, don't, I don't know if it's hard to do, how the velocity of the swings might help or hinder the process, I just, I don't know. But when it comes to charge shot, Nero is clearly channeling demon energy into his arm and then into his gun, or the bullets. Makes sense to me. But with the way that charge shot is incentivized, to the extent that you should arguably always be charging it, I wonder if it implies that Nero is doing this compulsively rather than consciously. Hell, I've reached a point with Nero where charging my gun is a pretty unconscious process to me. I barely think about doing it. If this is the case, you could read into that. I don't think you could really draw anything conclusive, but there are some interesting ideas you could come up with. I'd say it feels like he has an excess of power that he doesn't know how else to channel, so he just constantly or periodically dumps it into his gun. Unlike Devil Trigger, Nero cannot run out of charge shot. He produces this shit infinitely. He's overflowing with it. So he just directs it into whatever outlet. Again, notions of power and a lack of control. In DMC5, Nero was given an additional resource in the form of Devil Breakers. Breakers are a variety of prosthetic are a variety of prosthetics with different effects that can be used in combat. You can use one for an entire run if you wish, but they're called breakers for a reason. If you get hit while using them, they will break, and you switch to the next arm in your magazine. Alternatively, you can purposefully break one as a defensive or offensive measure, or finally, you can use their breaker moves, powerful attacks that break the arm after execution. You gain Devil Breakers by purchasing them before or within missions, or picking them up on the easier difficulties. This works into how Exceed and Charge Shot pushes the player to ready themselves for combat before the fact. With Devil Breakers, you spend time and thought setting up your magazine before each mission or boss fight. Again, Nero and the player are mentally and physically prepping for each encounter, taking that extra consideration to be as stylish and effective as possible when the time comes. Breaker attacks, on the other hand, work into the tryhard image. It's worth breaking an arm for this cool attack. Look how powerful I am! It's inferring that Nero can't look this cool without a cost, but he's more than willing to make that payment. What I think is interesting, though, is how the player's relationship with this resource changes over time. Since Devil Breakers cost money, the player will probably be quite conservative with them for the first playthrough, and probably won't use breaker attacks very often. It's more advantageous to hold on to the breakers you have and try not to break them for the most part. It's only after the first playthrough, when money becomes immaterial, that you can afford to use breaker attack after breaker attack. As such, this resource tells the player different things about Nero the more they play the game. On the first playthrough, I'd say they give the impression that Nero needs to, or is willing to, rely on other people. He had his hand ripped off, he's using Nico's breakers as a replacement. Their fragile and expensive nature makes them precious. Although they're called breakers, breaking them is the last thing you want to do. I may be getting a bit liberal arts here, but you could say that this shows us that Nero values- He uses the tools his friend gave him, fucking charged him for, and tries to preserve them despite their fragility. He cares about his connections to other people. He values them monetarily. On subsequent playthroughs, however, the breaker mechanic lends itself to that try-hard interpretation I brought up before. Now that you have the money, you're no longer incentivized to preserve your breakers nearly as much. Nero is willing to pay to look cool. He's what those in the Fortnite community call a whale. I think it's interesting that the further you are into the game, and consequently the more skilled you are, the more desperate Nero comes off. Fuck you, Nico, make me another one! I'm trying to impress my friends! It almost runs counter to the player's experience. To the player, this is them playing well, playing stylishly, playing efficiently. But in context, this is Nero breaking works of art left and right to succeed. Of course, this is down to how each player plays. You may not use breakers at all, you may still try to preserve them, but the point is that later in the game there is less incentive to preserve them. You could argue that this runs in opposition to that earlier interpretation, that Nero wants to preserve his bonds to other people. And to that I say, yeah, yeah, you could argue that. There's also the aspect of the player being at the mercy of the resource again. Sure, you can pick your loadout, but if you accidentally break an arm, you are stuck with whatever's left in your magazine in that order. If you pick one up during a mission, that's the arm you're stuck with unless you're willing to break it. Each arm serves a specific and limited purpose. When you equip one, a couple doors open, but more close. As such, your playstyle may be greatly affected by having a certain arm equipped. Again, this is the sword leading the player as much as the player leading the sword. To further bolster this, it's also worthwhile to consider how breakers are used. 
To use a breaker's unique ability, you press circle without locking on. This is Nero's only attack that requires you not to be locked on. You quite literally have to submit some level of control to avail of the power these resources afford you. To conclude, I think the important takeaways from Nero's resources are how they support his inferiority complex, or rather, how they frame him as inferior to Dante and how they convey his approach to overcoming said inferiority. They all incentivize the player to prep for battle, to psych themselves up as it were because, unlike Dante, Nero needs to. They also call the player to be more attentive to their actions in combat, timing exceeds, building up charge shot, timing your breakers carefully. Nero puts in a lot more effort under the hood to come off as cool as he does. And finally, the fact that the resources put Nero and the player at their mercy gives off the try-hard impression that he's willing to give up control for power, that he's willing to wield forces he can't completely control. I think that notion actually brings up another topic. It's evident that Nero wants to prove himself, to be able to back up the image of the badass stylish devil hunter that he presents, but his approach is to put power above control. But you could see this approach is somewhat misguided. Dante is in control. And you could argue that's a more fundamental component of his image than his power level. What makes Dante the legendary devil hunter? He's not crushing the savior's face, he's dancing around and playing with it. What makes a Dante moment in a cutscene isn't necessarily his strength, but rather his control of the situation. I mean, dude lets himself get eaten because he knows he's in control, that he has the skills to dominate this situation regardless, not that he's necessarily stronger. It goes back to what I said earlier, the difference between Nero and Dante taunting a boss is that Nero is trying to convince the enemy, and perhaps himself, that he's in control, whereas Dante is doing it because he absolutely is. You could read Nero's misprioritization of power as a sign of immaturity or impatience. He wants to emulate Dante, but he's just not there yet, so he uses power to compensate for his lack of experience. He wants an S rank before he's learned how to jump cancel. You could also see it as a sign of insecurity. He doesn't believe himself strong enough, so he puts more stock in the power of his weapons, believing they can compensate for that inadequacy, which is evidenced in DMC4 when he claims he needs Yamato, and in this small scene in DMC5. I've got all the power I need, right here. <sighs> so that's the gist of it. Do you see why I stress the importance of contrasting Nero to Dante? If Nero was plopped in DMC1 as the main and only character, I don't know how significant it would be that he needs to prep for combat, or that he's willing to forego control for power. I think it'd tell us more about the world, that demons are dangerous, take no chances, any fight with a demon is a desperate one, etc. Since we have Dante as a benchmark, we can frame these aspects of his mechanics as depicting inadequacy. Nero's sword and gun are mechanically demanding, but you feel that more when you contrast it to the simplicity of Dante's sword and guns in DMC1. I think it's very fitting that Capcom chose this dynamic as the basis for Nero's character. DMC4 was the first game to feature a new character as the main protagonist. It was a gamble. How do we get players invested in him? Or better yet, how do we do so without undermining Dante, the character that fans actually like? Well. Make it known to Nero that he has some big fucking shoes to fill, and make it known to the audience that the writers respect Dante as much as we do. With this framing, you could make a meta interpretation that Nero trying to prove himself to Dante is analogous to Nero trying to prove himself to the audience that he's worthy of being a DMC lead. And of course, his arc ends with Dante passing him the torch. He is the proprietor of DMC now. I wonder if his mechanics will change in future to reflect the fact that he no longer has to prove himself. Or maybe he'll have another rival to prove himself to. Maybe we already know who that rival is. Is that a good segue? Now on to Virgil, Dante's cold, calculated, power-hungry twin. Virgil was introduced as a playable character in DMC3, but he lacked his own defining resource. Instead, he just had Devil Trigger, like Dante. DMC4 introduced the resource that would define Virgil from then on, and that resource was concentration. It's important to note that DMC4 Virgil is actually the youngest incarnation of the character we see, just don't ask how he got Beowulf. As such, it's implied that concentration has been part of his character all along, it's not something that developed since 3. 
Concentration is an interesting case. It's by far the most prescriptive of the resources, and this is probably a result of it being added retroactively to a previously defined character. We know Exceed, or just the notion that Nero could rev his sword like a motorcycle, was part of his design incredibly early in production, and I wouldn't be surprised if this mechanical decision informed the character that Capcom ended up writing. This isn't true of concentration, and although I know that, I think it'd be evident even if I didn't. So how does it work? Concentration rewards the player for playing like the character we all know and have confusing dreams about. Virgil is calm, composed, precise. He doesn't run about, he strikes with purpose. He doesn't miss, everything is exact. You gain concentration by standing still, by walking, slowly, and by landing attacks. You lose concentration by running, getting hit, or missing attacks. Do you see what I mean when I say it's evident the system was built after his character had been defined? I just, I can't really imagine an action game developer deciding to incentivize standing still solely from a mechanical standpoint. This is also what I meant when I said it was prescriptive. It prescribes a certain style of play and disincentivizes you from deviating from it. Anywho, concentration is unlike other resources because it isn't spent for the most part. It's a resource that you want to hold on to at all times. There are three levels of concentration, and when you're at the max level, your attacks get a significant damage bonus. It also increases the range of Yamato's attacks, allows you to charge Beowulf's attacks longer, and gives Mirage Edge's attacks more hits. Finally, it allows you to perform Judgment Cut End when you're in Devil Trigger. It is a straight buff. As such, you ideally want to keep your concentration full for the entirety of a level. You only stand to benefit from it. I think concentration is a cool idea on paper, but I have a criticism for it in practice. When I started with Virgil in DMC4, I was being very, very careful with it. I was heavy into the role playing, standing still, walking slowly, and making sure not to attack frivolously. But I found I did a lot better when I, ironically, wasn't concentrating on concentration. Just being efficient with Virgil net me my concentration anyway, and it may have fluctuated when I missed my attacks or got hit, but it would always build back up pretty quickly. The thing is, all you really have to do is not get hit. You can gain concentration efficiently while playing Virgil a lot closer to how one would play Dante, frantically dashing about and cutting guys up. And I think this undermines the resource to an extent, because once you've built up a level of proficiency with Virgil, it's almost unnoticeable. Almost. A point of praise I have for concentration, though, is how it underlines Virgil's unique mechanics. I found that concentration is less about the fact that you shouldn't run, but more about the fact that, thanks to Air Trick, you don't have to run. It's not that you have to stand still, it's that Virgil, more than any other character, can afford to stand still. And it's not that you shouldn't miss your attacks, it's that <laughs> Judgment Cut never fucking misses. Virgil's mechanics lend themselves specifically to building concentration, and I think this speaks to his character. It's as if he's developed his abilities specifically to ensure that he doesn't have to engage with anything that would compromise his image, such as running or missing. Heavy Rain Sword seems to have been designed to ensure that he can make time to stand still. Couldn't make time to be a good dad! I could run this counter to the idea of Nero sacrificing control for power. Virgil is using power to maintain an air of control. I'd say for Nero, power is the end game. Being powerful and overwhelming the enemy is style to him. For Virgil, it's the starting point. The real key is using that power to impose his notion of style upon his subjects, being calm, unfazed, and effortlessly lethal. Another point of praise I have for concentration is the consequence of getting hit. The fact that you risk losing concentration by getting hit is extra motivation not to get hit. <laughs> I think this may be the best character building aspect of concentration. It feels like shit getting hit as Virgil. It just it hits different. You lose health, style, and concentration. The meter puts extra pressure on the player to do what they were already trying to do, play well. And it feels very Virgil to me. At his core, he's just as much of a tryhard as Nero, except he's aiming to maintain his badass perfectionist image, whereas Nero's aiming to cultivate that image. Virgil knows what to do to come off as cool as he does, there's just this constant pressure to do so. He has this extra layer of motivation to be perfect, 
that the other characters lack. In DMC5, concentration is still Virgil's main resource, but there have been a few changes. For example, Beowulf and Mirage Edge get their own super attacks alongside Judgment Cut End. The most substantial change in DMC5, however, is the fact that concentration can now be spent. If your concentration is at level 1, Virgil will automatically block any attack coming from an enemy he's locked onto. If concentration is at level 2, Virgil will parry, but doing either costs concentration. This mechanic is an extra reward for having high concentration, further incentive to build the resource. The fact that it expends concentration is merely for balancing's sake. If it didn't cost anything, Virgil would just keep blocking automatically, and it'd make bosses really fucking easy. Although... Every character in the game can parry, and Dante can block, but it requires effort and careful timing. Virgil does both automatically. All you have to do is hold down the lock-on button, something you'll already be doing a lot of the time, and that introduces a cool little dynamic. There have been many times where this mechanic has saved me without my express intention to use it. I was about to get hit, but Daddy Virgil was like, Competence. In moments like this, it can feel like Virgil is acting of his own accord. Like he's so strong-willed that he can break free of the player's control to perform even better than the player would have. To correct what would have been a mistake. Like, you were about to get hit scrub, I took care of that for you, but don't let it happen again. It's a small thing, but nonetheless significant. Especially when you consider that the player has more incentive to avoid damage with Virgil than with any other character. You could read this dynamic in a couple ways. You could say that Virgil is so committed to maintaining his image that he will act reflexively to do so. It's that ingrained in him. Or, from a more meta standpoint, you could say that he doesn't fully trust the player to maintain his image, so he can, and will, at times, intervene. In this case, it's not a reflexive act, but rather, it's so heavily intentional that it even supersedes the player's intent. It's that strong a drive, that prominent a concern. This dynamic also adds an admittedly very small layer of separation between the player and the character that isn't present for the other characters. It makes Virgil feel just a touch more distant, as if he's unwilling to relinquish full control to the player. Now, I could dive way into that as a character point. Between the trauma from losing his mother and his time as Nilo Angelo, there's a lot to be said about Virgil's relationship to control. And again, I could contrast this directly to Nero and his willingness to give up control. But this is a very small mechanical detail, and I think it'd be a bit dishonest to present it as anything but. There aren't any other mechanics at play working towards achieving the same effect. But I, I still think it's a neat detail to point out. There is one more way to spend concentration, and that is to perform World of V, an attack that costs the entirety of your concentration regardless of how much you have, and its power is relative to the amount you spent. It's a powerful attack. It has a huge AoE, and it gives you a ridiculous amount of iframes. It even restores health. I love how this mechanic supports the story and Virgil's character. As I said, concentration acts as further motivation not to get hit, to be perfect, to be like Virgil, reserved, suppressing his humanity. Well, World of V flips that on his head. You know what sometimes? Fuck it. Forget the pressure of concentration. Forget keeping everything locked up, dash it all, and just let loose. V is Virgil's human half, and through him, Virgil receives the most humanization he gets in the entire series. We see his vulnerable side, how his trauma from losing his mother and losing himself to Mundus affects him, and how he ultimately doesn't want to be alone. He wants someone to protect him. Pussy shit. And based Virgil represses that and channels it into his cold persona. Don't want to be alone? Well, I am alone, so if no one's going to protect me, mom, then I'm going to protect myself. By the end of 5, Virgil has come to terms with his humanity. What he perceived as a weakness that needed to be suppressed or purged is now something he's willing to accept, and World of V is Virgil demonstrating that growth. He allows his human side to come through, and that is reflected by spending your concentration. You're relieving yourself of the pressure a full bar of concentration imposes on you. You're intentionally giving up power. You're purposefully letting down the facade of the cold, precise perfectionist, and you're mechanically rewarded for doing so. In summation, I think concentration does a pretty good job at conveying Virgil's character. 
I think its prescriptive and limiting nature is incredibly fitting on paper, even if it does become less of a factor, the better you are. I think it's appropriate that the game doesn't force you to embody him by, for example, taking away your ability to run, but rather by giving you that option and punishing you for taking it. Virgil could run around, he could dance, but he chooses not to. That's Virgil, he doesn't let himself cut loose, despite being able to. It underlines that this persona Virgil puts on is ultimately a persona, a choice. As for the pressure aspect, as I said, I think it's the best or most effective part of the mechanic for character building. I think it successfully conveys to the player the pressure to be perfect that Virgil imposes on himself. It sets him apart from the other characters in that regard. And of course, in 5, we're finally given the option to let the facade slip. To consciously relinquish control. To choose to dance. And be mechanically rewarded for doing so. I don't dance. Finally, we're back to Dante. Dante has had the most trouble when it comes to character-defining resources post-DMC1. He had to share his Devil Trigger, and now everyone's an ass-kicking boss-taunting Demon Hunter. What makes you so special? In all three games since DMC1, all three of them, every single one, there have been attempts to add a new character-defining resource. But I don't think any of them are actually that good. Until we get to five. So in DMC3, his new resource is... Rage? Rage. Th the rage meter. Why? It's linked to his royal guard style. You build rage by blocking attacks, and you expend rage to perform an incredibly powerful counterattack. It may be obvious by my delivery, but I don't think this resource speaks much to Dante's character. What the fuck does Dante have to do with rage? He doesn't strike me as an angry guy. I mean, what the fuck does blocking have to do with rage? They should have at least called it the revenge meter, because, you know, Dante's whole thing in DMC1 was revenge. You build it by taking hits, and you use it to hit back, you know, like, revenge. But no, it's the rage meter. How does it make you play? Well, you know, it's Dante, so he's calm and composed. He lets enemies attack him because he knows he can block them, and he eventually counterattacks. Yeah, it's not very Dante to me. Calm and composed? No? I think the rage meter works a lot better in the context of DMC 4 and 5, where it isn't called the rage meter, and it belongs to one of many styles that Dante can switch between at a moment's notice. Post DMC 3, Dante's playstyle is typified by variety. Dante is master of all things combat. He can dodge everything. He can block everything. He can do it all, and this will be important later. But in DMC 3, you can only equip one style at a time. Some players may stick to Royal Guard for the entirety of their playthrough. They fucking won't, but to those people, the Dante they got was a calm counterattacker, someone who studies enemy telegraphs and waits for them to attack. It just doesn't feel very congruous with the character we're used to from 1, or the character we're presented with in the cutscenes of 3. I don't know, maybe it would have worked in DMC 2 if it were reframed as, like, the apathy gauge. You just sit there, straight-faced, letting enemies hit you, until you get bored enough to end the fight then kill yourself. In DMC4, the new resource was Disaster, and it does literally nothing for his character. To be fair, it is a resource tied directly to a weapon, Pandora, incidentally my favorite weapon in the franchise, so perhaps it wasn't supposed to tell us anything about his character. The idea is that you build up Disaster by using Pandora's light attacks, and you can spend it to perform Pandora's heavy gunslinger attacks. I already said it does nothing for his character, so I could move on, but instead I'm going to critique this resource because I think it runs counter to the philosophy of DMC4 Dante. As I just said, post-DMC3 Dante is typified by variety. He has all his guns and swords equipped, he can switch between any style at any time, and you are to use all those tools in concert. Whereas Exceed and Charge Shot causes you to focus on every individual hit with Nero, Dante's playstyle is more about the space between attacks, or lack thereof. Out of your countless options, what will you choose to do next? Disaster spits in the face of that variety, because it only rewards you for using Pandora. As such, I feel I'm wasting the resource when using any other gun. 
Sure, there are some situations where a shotgun or a handgun shot is the best option, but if you want to shoot for the sake of shooting, you know, get a bit of damage or style at range, then you better be using Pandora or you're wasting potential disaster. Personally, I would change the disaster gauge to fill when you use any gun. As it stands, I feel like the resource is pulling me away from my other tools, whereas if I had it my way, a full disaster gauge would pull me towards Pandora. It wouldn't reward a specific method of play, it would simply reward play. It wouldn't be that you have to use Pandora because you have to earn disaster, it'd be that you get to use Pandora because you've earned disaster. Just an idea I wanted to get out there. Modders, is, is that a thing that could be done? To summarize, this resource undermines your other ranged options, and since variety is the defining trait of Dante's playstyle, I think it's kind of lame. But whatever, let's move on. So, two games, two pretty weak resources from a character building standpoint. Poor Dante, you started this all, but you've been getting the short end of the stick ever since. I kind of understand why though. Dante is the creation of Hideki Kamiya, and the franchise has been directed by Hideaki Itsuno since DMC2. Itsuno's gone on record about being very careful with Dante. He equates him to an adopted son. He knows that he's not his creation, so he feels he doesn't have license to do whatever he wants with him or take him down whatever path he chooses. As he sees it, Dante completed his arc in DMC1, which is why he chose to make DMC3 a prequel, and chose to introduce Nero in DMC4. How do you develop the character while staying true to his original conception, without straying too far? Well, I think they hit it out of the fucking park in DMC5. What they did was nothing short of genius. So, as you all probably know, the main new resource Dante has is SDT, Sin Devil Trigger. But that's not exactly what I'll be talking about. SDT is essentially an extension of Devil Trigger, an even stronger demon form, and it's something Virgil also has access to, so it's not specifically a Dante mechanic. What is necessarily Dante, though, is how he interacts with it. When you enter SDT, you have committed to it. There's a short animation of you transforming, and then you stay in this state until the resource runs out. While in this state, you can't be staggered, all of your attacks have pierce and deal ridiculous damage, you can stun everything, delete anything, etc, and you're left to do as much damage as possible in the time you have with it. But there is one ability that changes that. Quadruple S allows you to enter SDT for a short period and exit it without expending any of the resource. More importantly, entering SDT through Quadruple S removes the animation of you transforming and cancels any animation Dante's engaged in. You could transform out of any long attack animation, out of any stun or cooldown, and this blows the doors open for combo potential. It's also his best method of dodging. It's his best method of closing the distance. Quadruple S is invariably Dante's most significant ability in DMC5. The catch is that you need to have a triple S style ranking to use it. That means that the style meter itself has become a resource for Dante to pull from. The style meter, it's genius, isn't it? It's something that has been around since the first DMC. It is necessarily DMC, and this ability has made it necessarily Dante as well. It makes so much sense for his character. From a mechanical standpoint, the player is more motivated to play stylishly with Dante than with anyone else. You are exponentially more powerful the better you play. Playing stylishly has always been the goal in DMC, but the style meter never had any input in combat, and it makes all the sense that the one character that taps into it as a resource is the legendary Devil Hunter himself. I think it really supports the aspect of his character that loves to fight. It's very similar to the original DT. You're rewarded for playing well with the means to play weller. When you play Dante in DMC5, you're itching to get to Triple S as soon as possible to really start laying the smackdown. It's a compulsion to flex as hard as you can so you can get to a point where you can flex even harder. It also helps that Dante is the easiest character to achieve a Triple S with, just because of the variety of his weapons. It works to further promote the idea of Dante as a master of all things combat. Since the style meter is so fundamentally Devil May Cry, the effect of Quadruple S reverberates through all of the characters for me. This may just be a symptom of me maining Dante, but whenever I play as another character, I maintain the same drive to reach Triple S as soon as possible, only to remember that there's no mechanical payoff unless I'm playing Dante. 
I'll reach triple S as Nero and be like, yeah, wait, what now? Making the style ranking a resource is so perfect for the series that it honestly feels like it should be extended to all characters in some form, as Devil Trigger was extended to all characters. But you know what? Fuck you. This is Dante's mechanic. Y'all took Devil Trigger, wrote a fucking song about it, forgot to credit him. So no, he gets quadruple S and you don't. He deserves it. He's earned it and nobody wears it better. You, you've got concentration, bro. Just concentrate or something. I can't gush enough about how good this choice is, so I'll stop myself here to talk about some changes DMC5 made to the style system. In DMC 1 through 4, style was tied directly to performance. If you got hit, you'd lose style. End of discussion. This isn't the case in DMC 5. If you take damage, it doesn't affect your style unless you get staggered. You're much less likely to get staggered while in DT. The weapon Cavalier allows Dante to tank through weaker attacks, and you can't get staggered at all in SDT, so getting hit will never lower your style. This change shifts the goalposts a little in terms of the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, and redefines what stylishness means to Devil May Cry. Although you'll still get a much higher score at the end of a mission if you don't get hit, getting hit is no longer as disincentivized on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. What is incentivized instead is composure. Or say it with me now, control. As long as you're still in control of the situation and enemies aren't throwing you off what you're trying to do, the game classifies this as stylish. This feeds into what I was saying about Dante's image being tied to control over the situation rather than power or perfectionism. Dante gets hit. We see it in cutscenes. He gets stabbed, he gets shot, he gets stabbed, he gets eaten, he gets stabbed, he gets eaten again, he gets punched, he gets stabbed, he gets sweep kicked by a clown, he gets stabbed. He's not a perfectionist like Virgil, but he remains in control. As long as he's on top of the situation, a cheeky hit here and there, being swallowed by a sky whale, doesn't undermine his image. This change to the style meter, I think, supports this interpretation, especially when you contrast it with concentration. Despite the fact that this change applies to all the characters, Virgil will still lose all of his concentration if he gets so much as nicked by a stray projectile, even if he's in SDT. This is actually a change from DMC4 in which Virgil wouldn't lose concentration by getting hit if he was in DT. As such, this change works to amplify the stressful effect of concentration and really hammer home Virgil's perfectionism, while making the style system fall more in line with Dante and by extension Nero's idea of style. Now getting hit is that much less punishing for everyone else, and consequently more so for Virgil. Dante and Nero can get hit without losing style, Dante can keep using quadruple S and perform at his highest, but Virgil will always lose concentration. It just adds more of a distinction between the sons of Sparta. Dante is about having fun while still coming out on top, while Virgil is about absolute perfection. Anyway, now to move on to the last resource they added for Dante in DMC5, and damn if it isn't almost as good as Quadruple S. Like with Pandora, Dante receives a new gun in DMC5 that has its own new resource attached to it, except it's not a new resource. Like style, it's been a fundamental part of the DMC formula from day one. Dr. Faust, this new weapon, uses red orbs as ammo. The currency of the series now becomes ammo for you to use. This choice was actually made to address a long-standing problem with red orbs, the fact that they become completely useless once you've bought everything. That's why when you see pro gameplay of DMC, the player usually has maxed out their red orbs. It was doubly insulting in DMC4 where red orbs were a category you were ranked on at the end of missions and you had to pick up all the orbs every time you played through a mission even though you had no fucking use for them. Topic for another day. Now, there's always a use for them. Nero's Devil Breakers also address this problem, and if you remove the middleman of having to purchase something, you could boil both of these resources down to the same thing, red orbs. But I'm glad they added one layer of abstraction for Nero. His resource on paper is not red orbs, it's Devil Breakers. Red orbs, the prototypically DMC resource in its pure form, are Dante's alone. Literally red orbs, he, he fucking throws them at people. Since the resource, like Devil Breakers, is tied to currency, the player goes through a similar arc to how the Devil Breakers impact them. You'll likely be a lot more reserved with Faust until you get that fuck you money. 
there's a good chance you won't use Faust at all until subsequent playthroughs since Dante is so stacked for options regardless. And unlike with Pandora, the resource here is actually disincentivizing you from using it for the most part. However, you can use Faust to gain orbs. The Place Hat ability allows you to place hats on enemies, and if you hit them while wearing one, they'll drop red orbs. Conversely, if they hit you, you'll drop red orbs. It's a risk-reward system. Faust is a gambler's hat, after all. I actually think this speaks to Dante's character quite a lot. When you use Place Hat, you are betting on yourself, and you can draw quite a few interpretations from this. You could see it as him making the fight a bit more interesting. Thanks to his experience, life and death just aren't high enough stakes to him anymore, so he's willing to spice things up even further by betting money on his performance. Or you could say it speaks to his mastery. This isn't a bet to him. This is a sure thing. Come on now. You know I'm going to be hitting you a lot more than you're going to be hitting me. There is no risk here. You could also say that this speaks to his cheekiness. You could frame this entire system as an extended taunt, in a way. You're placing hats on enemies. Look how silly they look, but this comes at a potential cost. You better have the skills to warrant this level of disrespect, or you're going to lose orbs. Overall, I think this mechanic feeds back to Dante's connection to the style meter. This hat system is somewhat reminiscent in that it rewards good play and punishes the opposite. Here, Dante is essentially adding another style meter to the equation for the sake of it. Why not, right? More fun for Dante. However, in your first playthrough, when you still have things to buy and red orbs hold more value as a reward, there is a different motivation you could tie to this. I see it as impatience. Dante's done this rigmarole of gaining orbs to buy his abilities four times already. I'm good, okay? Let me prove it to you through using Faust, and we can expedite the process. I mean, do I really have to save up to buy Stinger? So that's a neat aspect of Dr. Faust, but that's just a small part of the equation. The primary function of the weapon is to convert money into damage. As I said, during your first playthrough, you'll probably be more conservative, but I'll be looking at how this mechanic works when the player has enough orbs to use Faust as liberally as they want. And when that is the case, you can pull off some pretty cheesy shit. And by that, I mean, you can just fucking nuke bosses. The pay to win model is alive and well. I'm of two minds about this. One says it doesn't really speak to Dante's character. Dante revels in the fight. He wouldn't cheese a boss. The other says it speaks to Dante's power. It's fucking Dante. He can do whatever he wants. If he wants to one-shot a boss, he can. And eh, I guess I could imagine him doing it after a long day, you know, that scene from Indiana Jones. I, that's pretty Dante. I like that. What balances this overpowered mechanic out is the fact that no other facet of the game is incentivizing you to use Faust like this. Yes, you can win easily, but you lose orbs and you won't get style from it. And remember, Dante is the character with the most incentive to be stylish. You'll merely earn a hollow victory that is absolutely worth it on Hell and Hell, but nowhere else. So what does using red orbs like this say about Dante's character? Well, from a lore standpoint, it implies that he's done growing. Red orbs are how you upgrade your character. Dante flippantly using them as a weapon shows that either he doesn't need to be upgraded, that he's so strong, skilled, confident that he doesn't care if he needs to be upgraded, or that he has so many red orbs by this point that it just doesn't fucking matter. From a mechanical standpoint, I think it reinforces, again, Dante's love of the fight. Yes, this is an otherwise vital resource, but all that matters is the here and now. Essentially, fuck paying rent, let's get table service tonight. I'm having a good time. There's something else to consider, though. Once you have enough money, you know that no enemy in the game poses a threat anymore. You can simply nuke them with Faust if you're willing to forego style but you shouldn't want to forgo style, so you likely won't be using it. And as such, I'd say the resource supports Dante's character more in how it isn't used than how it is used. The knowledge that he has an objectively more powerful weapon that he's choosing not to use just underlines how much fun he's having and how in control of the situation he believes himself to be. He could end it immediately, but he doesn't. He's having fun. You're having fun. Smoke in sexy style. Why end it quickly? Compare this to Virgil's cheesy super moves, which are absolutely incentivized. They're the most stylish things he can do, and you're not punished for spamming them. Virgil would, Dante wouldn't. Dante's here for the dance. 
So, to summarize, Dante loves fighting. Thank you. Like and subscribe. But no, seriously, it goes beyond that. Dante loves DMC. No. Dante is DMC. Slaying demons, being stylish, he's absolutely crazy about it! Itsuno's team made the perfect choice here. How do you develop the character without fundamentally changing him? Well, look back to the inception. What elements could be seen as setups that are, as of now, lacking payoffs? And then pay them off. Style and red orbs have been here since the beginning. Allowing Dante to tap into them just makes him feel more synonymous with the franchise than he already was. I haven't done a deep interpretation of Dante's character like I did for Virgil and Nero because I think you can sum him up pretty succinctly. Simply put, he is the player's avatar. He jokes, he does stunts, he dances, and basically has fun. Because that's why you're here, right? You're playing this game to have fun? He's incredibly talented at fighting and seemingly scared of nothing. This is the aspect of the character for the player to strive towards. Mastery of the game. When you first meet a boss and Dante is taunting it, you're probably not there with him. You're a little worried about how this boss is going to kick your teeth in. Come back after a couple playthroughs, different story. You know, Dante knows, exactly how this fight will end. Let's skip the cutscene and get to the fun part. And that's all I think you need. There's a lot to say about Dante from a textual standpoint, why he is the way he is, but from a mechanical standpoint, this really is all you need. Dante is DMC. He is the player playing well and having fun. To really hammer this point home, to really beat this horse I hope I murdered, we should look at the last, last of Dante's new resources. The one I completely forgot about until recording because it isn't represented with a meter of some kind. Ignition. Ignition is another weapon-specific resource, and it belongs to Balrog, Dante's gauntlet weapons for DMC5. Fittingly, Dante has had gauntlets in all four games. They too have been here since the beginning. Balrog has two modes, blow mode and kick mode, that you can switch between. In either mode, you can perform certain actions to charge ignition. Once fully charged, Balrog's attacks do more damage, have a bit more range, and Dante gains access to each mode's strongest attacks for a limited amount of time until ignition resets. Like high concentration, it is a straight buff. From your perspective, you would ideally want Balrog ignited as frequently as possible while you're using it. The incentive here is pretty strong, I'd say. So, what does it incentivize you to do? Well, in blow mode, you've got to land a 10-hit combo without getting hit or waiting too long. In kick mode, you just have to dance. So, yeah, playing well and having fun. I could go on about how Ignition is like a mise en beam of Dante himself, or a simplified restatement of Devil Trigger, how the dance is functionally a taunt, or how fulfilling the combo requirement is analogous to raising the style meter, but we'd find ourselves at the beginning of the video again, so I'm just going to get back to the ending I wrote. I don't think they could have chosen the resources for Dante any better. They feel like the culmination of his development as a character from both a textual and a mechanical standpoint. Dante started this whole DMC thing off. Devil Trigger defined him in DMC 1, and it went on to define the rest of the series as a whole. Since then, he hadn't had a good resource to call his own, while other characters got their time in the sun. And now, we end with him having what I'd argue are the best resources possible for his character, and any DMC character to have, and they've technically been there all along. What a journey. Anyway. That concludes my discussion of how resources build character in DMC. As a whole, I think one of this series' greatest strengths is its ability to build character with mechanics, as well as every other avenue available to it. Design, animation, soundtrack, writing, all come together to create incredibly fleshed out characters, and this video just scratches the surface. I know I kind of skirted over SDT, or how Virgil interacts with DT differently than the other characters, but I'm making a separate video on the topic, so keep an eye out. But for now, thanks for watching. You can leave now. I'm, I'm just going to muse over the colors of the resources and what they might mean. Ser seriously, you can go. Think, think of this as like the credits. It's going to be kind of boring. Hmm. In DMC1, Devil Trigger was the same color as the weapon Dante had equipped. 
In DMC 3 through 1, Dante absorbed the power of his demonic weapons to enter Devil Trigger, so that makes sense. But in DMC 3, DT is white. I don't know what that means. In 4, DT is the color of the character's physical DT. It's the color of their aura? Maybe you could argue that Nero's was blue because he was using Yamato to enter DT. That's neat. In DMC 5, DT is purple for everyone. Purple is the color of Sparta. At least three established that, and I feel like it makes sense. Dante's red, Virgil's blue, Dad is purple. All the characters in DMC5 are sons of Sparta. All their demonic energy came from him. Makes sense DT would be purple. Nero's colors are red and blue, because he has traits of Dante and Virgil. Exceed is red. Fire. Charge shot is blue. Interesting that his gun's resource is blue, because, you know, Virgil refuses to use guns. Dante's color is tied to the one weapon that can't be switched. Exceed is tied to a button that would otherwise be a weapon swap button. Eh. Red orbs are red. Concentration is blue. This isn't a poem. STT is red for Dante, blue for Virgil. When you activate it, Virgil's becomes a different shade of blue, but Dante's becomes yellow. It's the same color as the style meter when it's in triple S. And Virgil's becomes the same shade of blue as concentration. Hmm. That thing that Trish has is dark red. I think it's because she likes to throw stuff. I've got all the power I need, right here.